Hello, um, I am Sarai Tyndall Soliano. Um, this actually is a very old version of my handout because it doesn't have the Soliano name. Um, about six months ago, I was recognized for the Order of the Laurel based on my research in Italian women's clothing and construction and uh, patterning. So that's kind of my little introduction of who I am. And when I teach, so there's, two, I linked two handouts for this class. One is focused on just the Italian women's um, clothing silhouettes. And the second handout is a handout that I developed more recently on just how to like, how to go about thinking about building yourself a full persona kit, uh, which is something that I seem to get a lot of questions on. And so I wanted to make sure that that was something that was available. So I usually start with an introduction of like the different silhouettes. I do myself, I do about three late. 1360s, 1370s, as far as style and fashion. Um, although every once in a while I do something that's a little closer to like 1390 and like 1400 because, you know, it's really pretty. <laughs> so the early part of the 14th century, you have to think about who is Northern Italy trading with, especially on the Eastern side of the peninsula. Um, so my persona is a Venetian woman that is married to a Venetian condottieri lord um, that is also has a trading interest in the Mediterranean. Um, that's my husband's persona. <laughs> uh, he does a ton with trading and condottieri and things like that. Um, so. The beginning of the century, especially on the eastern side of the peninsula, you see a lot of influence from the Byzantine style. You have straighter body shapes in the clothing. You're not seeing the like the baggy clothes that are coming from the northwestern portion of Europe, England, France, places like that. You're seeing very straight silhouettes, but there's also a lot of like bands of embellishment that you're also that also don't come from Western Europe. So, and those fashions exist through the 1360s. Like this gown has become much more fitted to her body, but it's still maintaining a lot of the Byzantine influences that you're seeing on the lady on the left. So you move into the later 14th century and you start seeing more influences from Western Europe as the trade there expands. Um, so you get the wider lower necklines, you get a tighter fit through the upper body, sort of defining the bust line, defining the waist. Um, but you also still maintain some sort of Italian influence. The hips tend to be a little bit straighter in the dress. Um, you have the bands of decoration around necklines. Things like that are happening. So I also like to talk about fabric. Uh, what, what fabrics are we making our clothing from? Um, the, if you have not read any of the Taquinum Sanitatis manuscripts, like go through and just read the translations. Um, they actually provide a lot of information on just day-to-day -day life in Italy, which is something that I wasn't 100% expecting when I first started looking at them, because I was looking at them for the images initially. And then I found that, you know, there's information on types of wool and where to buy it. There's information on what to use linen for, what to use the wool for, things like that. Um, all of my translations on here, because I admittedly cannot read what can't, like dyslexic doesn't happen. 
So I use uh, Good Cookery's translations. They're fairly comprehensive. Um, they're missing a couple of them. And I haven't been able to like find a translation for like silk, which he doesn't have. Um, so, you know, we have our wool. I also love that like, these are like tailor shops. I love these tailor shop images, <laughs> they're like my favorite. Um, and then we have linen. And one of the things that you can also understand from this is that like this tailor shop where we're making wool clothing is mostly employing men, except for the one lady here in the middle, this middle image right here. Um, but it's mostly employing men. We go down to the linen shop that's making underclothes and things like that, and it's employing entirely women. So that's interesting too, to see those sorts of divides in who's making what. Um, and then the silk tailor shop is again, I all men, this might be if this might be a woman right here sitting here in the front, but in general, it's all men again. But we see a quilted garment over here. We see a garment with some buttons on it over here. And you can actually see seaming, the seaming of the sleeve on this garment that's hanging here. You can see the seaming of the sleeve on this garment over here and this one here. I hope this is blown up well large enough for everyone to see it well. Like, let me know if it isn't. <laughs> So what are our garment layers? You have your kemika, which is gonna be your shift or your chemise. Um, thin linen, if you are lucky enough to be able to afford that. Or it is going to be, um, if you are a, like a lower class, like actual lower class, like not even one of those ladies working with one of the tailor shops lower class, um, it's possibly actually a rough linen cotton blend fabric. Um, the fine linens were actually expensive. Um, and the linen cotton blend was actually a cheaper fabric than the cheap linen at the time in Italy. This is not true for most of the rest of Europe. This is really only true for Italy, which was getting direct cotton imports from the southern side of the Mediterranean. Um, your over and under gowns. So the vestido is gonna be your, your basic gown that provides your support um, if you're wearing a supportive layer. And I'm gonna stand up so you can see this gown and then I'm gonna reposition my camera. There we go. All right. So at the moment I'm wearing my working class gown and it's supportive but it's not super tight i have a pretty free range of motion in my shoulders i missed set one of the sleeves i need to go back and fix it um but i have a pretty pretty free range of motion in my shoulders in this dress so i can do pretty much anything that doesn't require me tripping over the skirt in it um, but then I usually hitch up my skirt and do that. This is a, I want to say lower class, but a lot of times when people think lower class, they think like the poorest of the poor. And that's not accurate. We're really talking more of the, um, like people working in those tailor shops. Um, so the uh, apprentice tailors or uh, stitchers, house stitchers, things like that. Um, so probably craftsmen of some type, they're possibly working in uh, somebody's house as a servant or something like that. So the clothing is of okay quality. It's going to follow the fashion of the time, but it's not going to be the extremes of the fashion of the time. Um, I like to use uh, worst, worsted weight wools 
for most of my clothing. And I'm gonna hold this up and maybe we can see through it a little. Yeah, there we go. You can kind of see through it from the light and see my arm going up now. Um, so it's a very thin wool. It's a very smooth front finish to it, things like that. Years ago, when I first started researching 14th century fabrics and things like that, um, I was reading um, John Monroe's, oh, did we lose my screen share? So I, the picture, when your screen is up, people can't see you as well if they have, oh. you know, I, I stopped it for now and when you come back from showing your body, then you'll just that share. Makes sense. I forgot about that. <laughs> that makes sense. So we can just go back and forth as you show people and then when you come back, just start sharing your screen again. Yeah, okay. So at this point, I'm probably going to mostly just be talking about the clothes because the rest of it's just a bunch of writing and you don't necessarily want to listen to me read writing off of a screen. Um, so we don't really need the rest of this. Um, that's actually a really good point and I apologize. I definitely forgot about that. <laughs> it's okay, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> so I normally wear my sleeves rolled up just because I also, this is what I wear in the summertime and I, and I like have to have 14th century on and like I can't wear my Roman. Um, so it, it is, I wear this to stay a little bit cooler. I get asked a lot, like, how do you survive in wool when it's 98 degrees outside? My answer is barely. <laughs> I honestly don't, I'm not, I, I am temperature sensitive, which means that outside of a pretty narrow range of temperatures, I'm uncomfortable. So if it goes over about 85 degrees, I'm uncomfortable no matter what I'm wearing. So I just honestly just deal with it. Um, but my husband, who doesn't have the same temperature sensitivity that I have, says that he feels the same level of comfort in a layer of thin linen and a layer of thin wool as he does in two layers of linen. So if anything, they, they work together to try and cool you down because the linen will pull the initial moisture off your body and then wool holds a ton of water before it actually feels wet. So it has the ability to dry off as like the breeze goes past you and things like that. And then because both layers hold a lot of water as breeze goes through your clothes, it actually cools you down. You'll actually, you would be surprised. Um, So to kind of finish off my, my working class dress, um, one of the things you'll see images of working class women, well, sometimes they have their hair up in braids, but more often they're wearing a veil or a turban or something like that. So there's a couple of different ways to do that. I have my hair braided to begin with, just pretty simply. You can use a Brigada cap this one is actually too small for my hair to put into it braided. Um, so I'm gonna skip it. I'm just gonna go straight to the turban. Um, for the turbans, you can take a, a large square, fold it in half like a triangle, or you can take a really long strip. Where is that one? There we go. So this is just a really long rectangle veil. Let me actually do this one. So take my braids, try to wrap them up on the back, and then pull this across my forehead. Pull the whole thing up, make sure that my braids are caught up inside of the turban. And then you just start twisting the ends. And it looks really pretty done in silk, but linen is probably a more appropriate fabric. And if you're wearing this in the heat, you definitely want to do this in a lightweight linen, not in silk. So then I just wrap them around my head. 
tie them, tie a half knot back here. And then I take the ends and I just sort of wrap them back up. And then find anything that's sort of sticking out awkwardly and you have a turban. And this will stay pretty well, just pretty much all day. Um, yeah, if it's warm outside, I don't like to wear silk on my head. That will cause you to overheat. Um, I prefer to wear linen. Um, but it also keeps your hair clean all day, which is important factor to life. Um, so there's that. You might want to wear a hood with a lower class gown. Um, a lower cl class woman might have some small pewter rings. Um, these are Billy and Charlie rings, if you're familiar with them as a vendor at Penzec and online. So these are just little pewter some rings. Sort of like fair pewter fair brooch or something like that that's part of their personal jewelry. They're not going to have a lot. Um, if we move on to middle class clothing, I'm actually going to change my dress. Um, I'm just going to put this up to share while I'm uh, I'm changing and then I'm going to close my camera for a minute. <laughs> so when, when people tell me they want to start building a kit, um, one of the first things I ask them is, so you want a 14th century kit, but do you want to be early in the period, middle of the period, late period? Do you want a specific country or, and is there a specific social class that you're looking at? Because each of these things is going to influence what you're wearing to a certain extent. Um, and while there's definitely similarities, especially in the later 14th century across all of the countries, and there's maybe less difference in clothing um, between the uh, maybe a, a merchant class person, middle class per person versus low mobility, as far as you know, what the clothes would be made out of and look like and things like that. You're still gonna have some variations. And it helps to understand what those variations are going to be before you start making things. Now, if someone is like, well, I just want to do 14th century and I want to make some clothes, but I don't really have any serious like ideas on where I want to be or what I want to do yet. I usually have them make a mid 14th century like merchant class coterie um, because then they have a supportive gown. They can always layer something else on top of it. Uh, as they get a better idea of what they want to do, where they want to be. And it's a little easier to, you know, go one way or the other from there. Okay, so we have a question in the chat box. Did the lower sure. classes wear dyed cloth in the early part of the century? And if so, what colors for their dresses? I suspect that in many cases, the lower class, so we're talking um, craftsmen, craftswomen, yeomen, that sort of lower class, probably did wear some dyed clothing. Another thing to remember is that second and third hand clothing trade was huge 
It was one of the largest trades in London in the middle of the 14th century. So if you're from a lower class, you're most likely not making yourself clothing. You're going and purchasing clothing from a third-hand vendor. So the fabric was probably dyed originally, and it's probably heavily faded or um, it might be worn out in spots, things like that. Now, the very lowest classes, often the only fabric available to them were things like russet or blanket, which is a kind of a coarse wool in a sort of iron brown red color. Um, now this is, a lot of this information is from John Monroe. If you want to go read his book, he has a book called Wool, Cloth and Gold. That's very informative on the English and Lowlands wool trade, uh, which is where the bulk of the wool was coming from in the 14th century. Um, I definitely also started my research with the English wool trade and then just sort of like somehow it ended up in Italy over the years. <laughs> so I don't know, any other questions at the moment? Will I finish lacing myself into this? There are not any other questions in the chat box, but if anyone has some, please type them there. All right, I'm dressed enough to the point where I think I can keep this uh, PG. So <laughs> I will come back on camera so you can see the difference in the fit between my lower class gown and my upper class gown. I have a lot more bust going on at this point. Um, so I'm almost, this dress, my weight has changed so many times since I made this dress and like shifted to other places. So it doesn't quite fit the way it fit when I first made it. Um, all right. So now that I'm laced into this, so I wear the same undergown for both my um, middle class, so merchant class outfits, and for my lower nobility outfits. Um, I am going to adjust the camera so I can get behind the light again. Um, so this one has buttons on the sleeve. It also has a flared sleeve. I'm going to do up some of the buttons, but probably not all of them. How am I doing on time? Okay. And the sleeves fit much tighter to my arm than the other dress, even though I never did put it on the sleeves. So I have a lot more bust support. I'm not sure if you can see because this dress is so dark. It's the only one I have though right now that fits. Um, and then- can see it pretty well. You can see it pretty well? Okay. So then I would, if I'm doing a, like a middle-class impression, I have a dress that sort of slips on over the top. <laughs> It's a little tight right now. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> and this is the reality of getting dressed by yourself. Oh, yeah. Wait until I bring in the other one. It's going to be hilarious. So it's my middle class dress. My neckline is, it's low, but it's not super low. It's not adding to the illusion of pressing up my breasts. 
which was something that was spoken against by the uh, moralist writers of the time. I came across a really interesting one via uh, somebody else's website a while back who was talking about the indecent exposure of the brass <laughs> by the dresses. Um, I had, there's a question in the chat box. What is the approximate decade of this dress? This dress actually is inspired by a painting. So yes, I'll try to find the link and put it in the chat box. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. I meant to get that. Um, yes, this is based on a 1360s painting. Uh, the original dress was just a red panel down the middle. And then you also had some like floral cutouts around the bottom. But I, I put this together. Um, we were doing something with our local barony where I didn't have anything with the baronial heraldry on it. And so I redid it with red chevrons, which the red chevron on white field is our baronial heraldry from the local barony. So that's how I ended up with this dress. It's also white. I don't wear white, mainly because I find myself falling in the grass a lot. So now as a middle class woman, I would maybe go out and spend time at the market or something like that. But for the most part, so I'm not gonna wear a turban, but when I'm out and about, I do want to still like protect my skin to a certain extent. So I might wear a veil for that, or I might wear a veil for, um, Uh, like going to church. So this is a reproduction of actually the London find um, hairpins. They're pretty easy to make with some craft wire. This one needs to be hardened a little bit. But I would use that to hold my hair in place. Um, if you don't have London hairpins or you know you don't have time to make yourself one, these like hairpins from the store work really well and are a similar shape. So I'm just going to stick a couple of pins in and then can ignore the curls in my ends like doing that. And then to go out and about, put a veil, sit again. So I'm going to adjust a veil and I don't want to, I still want to, you know, show off that I'm wealthy. So I might put it a little bit further back, not covering as much of my face. All right, this is a bit thrown together. I swear I look more put together when I actually but I'm not trying to like demo it. <laughs> so then I have a veil. I'm all set for church or to go out to the market. And I have my nicely made dress. Some additional accessories that I might consider wearing. Um, maybe an engraved silver ring. I need this. I'm actually kind of proud of it. <laughs> So I might wear an engraved silver ring. If we're kind of, you know, wealthy merchants, I might even have a gold plated ring. Um, and then I might have earrings. And maybe, probably not pearls. Um, I might also have a coral necklace or some other type of bead necklace. And I might have a decorative purse to carry a few coins in because really the merchants are just going to bill my husband. <laughs> so I am going to move on to the upper class moving because it requires a little bit more work. And we're about halfway through the class time. There you go. So we have another question in the chat box. Um, 
I've noticed that a lot of veils are made oval or circular, but your veils are square. Is a square veil more period? So, no particular shape is more period than others, in my opinion. Um, my study of manuscript images, I have noticed circulars, half circles, half ovals, ovals, squares, squares folded in different directions to make them drape differently. And like pretty much every variation you can think of in there. Um, really, you, you have to decide what, what is the image that you're trying to reproduce. Um, is one shape look better on you than another shape? So I find that I actually really like the way the square veils fall against my face. Um, I will sometimes also do fold it over so that just a little bit of it on the on one corner. See if we can see that. So one corner of it, and then put the bias against my face, and I actually really like that. And then you have these nice little like corners that come down and float in the breeze and everything. Um, but I'll also sometimes put a pleat across the top because that will give it a little bit more shape as well. It's, yeah, um, there's a lot of options for veils. Um, you're not limited to just like a single type. One of the reasons I have a lot of square ones is because I admittedly buy most of my veils from Dharma Trading pre-Kent. Um, <laughs> It's, here, I'll just type in the address for their website. Um, they have a lot of silk veils in different sizes in squares and rectangles that are pre-hemmed. So I, yeah, it's, it's a lot easier to just order from them versus trying to like spend hours hemming a circle or something like that. Um, I'm going to pull off this over down. You guys get to watch the incredibly awkward process of trying to pull these things off by themselves. There we go. Now I'm going to start the process of getting myself dressed into the upper class outfit, which starts actually with my hair. So I'm going to do hair taping. <laughs> I'm rolling it off of the card that it came on. Um, I order all of my silk ribbon, taffeta ribbons from Burnley and Trowbridge. I'll write that, put that in here too. I also buy pretty much all my fabric from them. <laughs> Especially my worsteds. They have some of the best prices for worsteds that I've been able to find. And they often have good color selections, although their color selection changes regularly. And then, so, I'm gonna look for the middle of the ribbon, more or less, hopefully. And I'm going to tie each half to the base of my hair. And there's, I've seen the other methods of doing this. I've seen some people just tie like to a single ponytail and then split the ponytail. Um, I've seen people work with two ribbons and tie one ribbon to each ponytail. Um, this is how I prefer to do it. And then, and my ribbon, there we go.
And I just start wrapping it around. And you want to try and evenly space it. And you don't want to like yank it tight, just snug enough that it stays in place, but not so tight that you turn your hair into like a board. And probably should have put some oil on my hair before I got started. Oh well. <laughs> it holds together a little bit better by like, like I purposely didn't wash my hair last night because it was like, well, I won't be able to get this to stay at all if I wash my hair <laughs> before this. Um, that's another thing. If your hair is, um, if your hair is like mine where it's already a little bit wiry and then it's better to actually like have it a couple days dirty to do it. And then when you get down to the end, you want to actually pretty much just wrap the ribbon on top of itself. Like that. Can you see? Yeah, there we go. And then I hold on to that one for a minute. I do the other side. That's going pretty good. So I have had this work for most hair types. Um, I have a friend that has like baby soft blonde hair at like 25. She still has baby soft blonde hair. I maybe hate her a little bit. Actually, I love her. <laughs> She's really sweet. Um, but hers is like, I can get it to stay in her hair, but it's a challenge. Um, but I've never had it fall out of anybody else's hair. Um, and my hair is super long. So my hair is at the top of my hips. Your hair does not need to be that long for this to work. Um, top of like your chest, like maybe just above your bra band is as long as your hair is not like insanely thick, will absolutely work. You'll just want to start them. I have them starting at the base of my skull down here. Like you'll want to start them up here, like right behind your ear instead. Then we just take this with the ribbons, wrap it over, wrap it to the back. And then the reason why I did that multi wrap was because now I'm like sort of pulling the ribbon out along the length of the hair. And then we just take the rest of the ribbon and wrap it around our head until we can tie off. Uh, three yards, four yards, four yards. <laughs> you could probably do three. Um, I usually buy four, just like four yard chunks. There we go. All right, I got some stray curls that aren't gonna go away today. So we're just gonna make them purposefully curl. There we go. <laughs> All right, so now, that I have my hair done because I don't want to do this once I've got my dress on and you'll see why in a second. This is the gown I'm going to be putting on today. This is the Cipriani style gown. It has a wide sleeve on it um, and a wide kind of low neckline. <laughs> This one is specifically taken from one of the Tycoon Sanitatis manuscript images. I don't think, hang on a second. I might have, okay. <laughs> I have my shoulders caught. Hang on a second. Ugh. 
Oh, there we go. <laughs> so I can get my arms into the sleeve, but then getting it over my head is always a little tricky with this dress, and I straight up cannot close it on my own. So it laces up the side, but I have not yet been able to successfully lace it on my own. And I have to have somebody else do it because I get that first one done and then I'm like, I can't find the back. Um, so I'm gonna hold this closed. You can see with this dress that it shapes to my body and across my bust line more than the other dress did. The other dress was a little bit earlier in the century too, as well as being more of a middle class dress. This dress is more upper class, ginormous sleeves, ginormous sleeves. <laughs> um, in addition to being a little bit later in the century. So I have that, I have a necklace on. I have a little brooch that just sort of lives on this dress. Um, uh, there we go. Try to <laughs> make sure that I'm like a good angle for you guys. Um, I probably would not wear a belt with this dress. There's basically no visual evidence for a belt being worn with these dresses. I wore a belt with this dress while I was an apprentice because that's part of SCA culture. But I didn't, I do not wear one now. And I haven't worn one since my elevation. Um, I absolutely would have more jewelry as an upper class woman. Um, I might have a signet style ring. I would definitely have some sort of large jeweled silver and or gold ring. This is a, um, I found this website out of um, Sweden, I think, and they're doing really nice reproduction jewelry in silver and brass. So I will try to post that. I'll post it to the Facebook group later because I got to dig up the website. All right. So yeah, I might have a variety of rings to wear because, you know, that's going to be a way to show my wealth. Um, question in a chat box about lining the sleeves. Are the sleeves lined like, or is the skirt lined like the sleeves? It is not. So there is visual evidence for lining and unlined overgowns. I live in Ohio. <laughs> I try to wear this clothing at Pensick in the summer. <laughs> like, I was not putting a layer of silk between my body and this dress. Like that was just not an option. Um, I think I think one of the two images that this is based off of, the skirt is shown as lined and the other one it's shown as unlined. Um, so I decided to just go with unlined. Um, it makes it, it, the fabric is so soft. This is wool. This dress is wool, the sleeves are lined in silk. Like, the fabric is still really soft, it moves really nicely, and I don't, I don't have to worry about overheating and like literally sweating to death inside of silk. Um, yeah. So this is my pattern oster. This was made for me as a wedding gift by a friend of mine. Um, I have to show off the, the primary beads on this, the god beads. Their little eyes. <laughs> um, so my friend who has a sense of humor laid out the pattern oster in a box, like a flat box, with all of the eyes turned up so that when I opened it, I was faced with a box of eyes. <laughs> um, but they're actually based on a um, Milanese um, glass style that was in production in the 14th century. So. Yeah, <laughs> so it was a really awesome wedding gift, like seven years ago. <laughs> it's been seven years since I got married, holy cow. Um, so yeah, so the full outfit with you know, pattern oyster and the sleeves and all of my jewelry, and I'm this like perfectly lovely, like 14th century noblewoman. 
Um, that it's so pious, you can tell because of how much money I spent on my pattern poster. Because <laughs> this is a lot in glass beads in the 14th century. Um, you don't see a lot of upper class women wearing veils outside of church or in the veneration of a saint or something like that. The, this is a conversation that I've had, had a number of times with various people and probably one of the best conversations that I, I've had on the topic was with um, a Laurel and former Duchess from this area. She's, she moved to Vancouver. <laughs> I'm sad. Um, but uh, her name is Tenguistel. She's studied uh, Tudor clothing for, God, 30 years or longer. Um, and we were talking about, you know, why would you've got all of the rest of Europe where women wear veils just all the time. It's very rare to see a picture of a woman without a veil. Then you have Italy where it's very common to see women with, without veils. And we were discussing it. And the conclusion that we came to is that the rest of Europe is a little bit colder than Italy. So they're trying to keep themselves warm. Whereas in Italy, there is less concern about that, but there is a lot of concern of your skin becoming dark from the sun. Um, and you, so if you aren't wearing a veil most of the time, you're indoors, you're in your salon, you're in these like buildings that are designed to stay cool during the day when it's hot outside and the sun is at its highest and you're most likely to burn. But yes, you're going to still cover your hair in front of God. <laughs> so that was, that was our conclusion on it. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. Questions. More questions. I love to talk about this, obviously, for like endless amounts of time, as I've just proven. Um, so... <laughs> So we had a couple questions in the chat box. I answered one of them. Um, I shared the link to your blog post on this dress in the chat box so they could see the paintings that inspired it. And you also have a link to, I guess, your dress diary for it there. So yeah. thank you. Um, any more questions, you guys either raise your hand or type in the chat box. And uh, we have about 10 minutes until the next class. So we have time to cover questions if you have them. I'm looking at the like rest of the stuff I have over here. Enamel jewelry is another thing that upper class women might have had. This was made for me by my laurel. <laughs> so for my elevation. <laughs> so I'll wear this sometimes instead of my coral necklace now. Um, I went to a lot of events between my elevation and everything shutting down. So I've actually had a chance to wear a lot of this jewelry. <laughs> I do have a question about the brooch in the middle. Um, I see that a lot. So we have like pictorial evidence of that somewhere. I guess in the Tacuinum, I can't really see that close on, on their dresses because they're kind of far away. Um, the miniatures are far away. Um, but is it appropriate all the way through the 14th century if you're wearing um, a gonella or a fitted Gothic dress to have a brooch in the center on um, your overdress? Um, so most of the evidence we have for like the brooches in the center on the dresses like this is actually from English and French um, effigies from the mid 14th century. But it's such an easy way to wear some of your jewelry that, you know, because in the SCA we love to reproduce the brooches that are found and things like that. So most of my dresses have a brooch that just lives on them um, because popping these on and off is actually kind of a <laughs> yeah, um, it is. It is. Even getting yeah. one on is like, yeah, it's hard. You get one on, and you get it on like while you're not wearing the dress, and then it lives there. And I think that also goes to show just how often I don't wash a lot of these garments, um, because if I find that I have sweated into it, what I'll actually do is I'll hang it up inside out 
and I'll mist it with a distilled water and vodka mixture. Um, and I will get to the silk clothing question in a second. I just saw that. Um, and so it's, you have to have distilled water because you don't want any mineral deposits. Um, so one part distilled water, one part like mid-level vodka, you know, whatever you're normally drinking. Um, and you don't need very much, like fourth of a cup of each, put them in a mister bottle, just spray like the parts that have been sweat soaked um, and then lay it out to like air out. Um, if you have a dehumidifier or something like that, you can lay it next to that. Um, and then that, that's how I treat my wool. That's how I treat my silk too. Um, and I don't have, I don't have a lot of silk. Um, silk clothing for the aristocracy. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would say even the lower noble classes were wearing silk. Um, maybe they weren't wearing the expensive silk brocades that Sartor is reproducing right now, but they were wearing silk. Um, it might just be a little bit of silk on the lining of a sleeve. Um, it might be, you know, a, a simple silk gown, but they would have been wearing silk. If you think about it, you've got the, the Luca silk trade, you've got um, the Milanese silk trade, you've got the Venetian silk trade, these huge silk trades that's coming out of Northern Italy. You have sericulture technology that started in the 12th century. So they've got an established like sericulture base in Italy. Um, yes, so much more so than even France and definitely more so than England. My girls are just, they do not want to behave today. <laughs> so they're just like going everywhere. You know, for me, that just teaches me that in period, everything wasn't as perfect as a painting all the time. People had Absolutely. hair just like we do, you know what I mean? And Um, yeah, I don't know. Any other questions, folks? Uh, you're also welcome to email me off my blog or find me on Facebook. I, I will totally answer questions. Um, my blog has not been getting a lot of updating in the last six months. I also stepped up as my kingdom's minister of arts and sciences like four months ago. So my priorities have kind of been like, wait, which way am I going? <laughs> This is actually a lot of fun to teach today. Thank you. <laughs> you have a, a question on sumptuary laws. Um, so a lot of the sumptuary laws that we think of from Italy are actually dating to the 15th century. There are some really, I do have um, a handout on my classes and PDFs page on At Northern Italian sumptuary law where like, I definitely focus on some of the crazier ones. Um, but one of, the, one of the interesting ones that I have found over time is that there were definitely restrictions on women's outer clothing. So cloaks and hoods and capelets and things like that, um, that came and went from like the 13th through the 16th century. Um, and there would be exceptions for like widows or there would be exceptions for uh, religious women or something like that because they put in these like these, these restrictions on their, their cloaks and stuff. And then somebody would be like, but I'm a widow and I don't want to be harassed when I'm in public. So like, I want to wear a full veil and a hood and everything. And, be like, oh, fine. So it's really, really funny because like, these laws are made by men. And then most of the information we have where women themselves like have written letters, like what exists of those dates to the 15th century, but they're, they're amazing. Italian women, I think on average were better educated than um, women of other portions of Western Europe. And they would write these insightful arguments about why the sumptuary laws that have been put in place by men were hurtful to the women of the community and things like that. It, there are truly amazing writings. I like uh, all of the translations. So I don't read Italian. I'm actually very terrible at languages, um, which makes me very sad. But... <laughs> 
Yeah. So there's a question. Um, there's a question on the enforcement mechanism for sumptuary laws. Um. So yes. I uh, like most things in that period. It, it was a bit of hit or miss. Um, Italy has done a much better job of preserving those records of enforcement than, say, England has. Because England, if they're like written on like scraps of paper and they threw them away. <laughs> I do know that there are ways of reporting uh, on, on women. So if you weren't caught, you know, by someone while you were wearing it, um, there were secret ways to report. Yes, there was, there was some of that. Um, there was also um, laws that would allow you to pay a fine and then have a small token that allowed you to continue wearing the garment or the item or things like that. Um, and then if you had enough money, you could just bribe off people anyway. Um, <laughs> so yes, there was enforcement, but that enforcement frequently had ways around it. But yes, there are some answers in the box um, about the niches where you could put the notes in Florence and Venice. There's a uh, documentation of that. Um, and then you would be fined, and there are records of women paying the, or the family paying the fine for certain um, violations, and that's how we know um, that people were actually breaking the rules, even though there were rules. Thank you. Hi, so thank much. you for coming, everybody. It's been a pleasure teaching today, honestly. And so. if you guys have any questions for her, you can find her on Facebook under that name, Sarai um, Tindall Soliano. Sarai Tindall Soliano.